God who makes a path of righteousness and peace in the midst of evil and war. Grant us the courage to follow our Savior Jesus as he brings your reign into the midst of the powers that oppose you. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, the Women's Bible Study wishes to thank everyone who participated in the bake sale last week uh, for Ukrainian relief. $910. Wow. wow. It's on here. Um, how about try vocal one? <coughs> it was working earlier. <laughs> So the electrical 
charge has not been set yet. So we can call it or it has next it. week. Or it has it. Come on, find out. Uh, let's begin worship in earnest now. And stand, please stand for our call to worship. Give thanks to God, for God is good. God is love, your Open the gates of righteousness. That we may enter and give thanks. This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice in the in it.
Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Just an opportunity for forgiveness. <laughs> Amen? Amen. So let's read this scripture together, and we'll do it responsively, because I can't be trusted to read all of it. <laughs> Listen to the word of God. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Lord, save us. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his, his light shine on us with bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The word of the Lord.
couple of prayer requests to share with you. Faye Farrar requests prayers for her husband, Ray, who's having some difficulty with his leg. He's going to be having some tests and we'll hear the outcome on the 20th. Please pray that he won't have to have his leg amputated. Uh, and a prayer request from Judy Kitching for her neighbors, the Richardson family. This family needs our, uh, our church family to pray for them for multiple reasons. Let's join together in prayer. All glory, honor, and power are yours, O God, by right, because you are the creator and the redeemer of all creation. When the powers of evil, evil rise up, you send your son and your people to stand against them. You are the one who demands justice and mercy for all creation. We give you thanks for all the ways you bring your steadfast love and kindness to us and to all creation. We thank you for the opportunities you give us to stand with Jesus on the side of those who are oppressed and misused. We thank you for this day, this beautiful day that we can gather together and praise you as your people. We pray for your reign to come into its fullness and for us to be faithful servants of you by being faithful caretakers of one another and of all creation. We come to join with Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem and makes his stand against evil power and injustice. Help us to not be those who wave their palms but refuse to enter into the sufferings of our Savior. Fill us with courage that we may be true disciples of Jesus. We ask that you intercede in the prayer requests that have been spoken aloud and those that we keep in our hearts. All these things we pray through Christ, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father,
Rams, isn't it? Yeah. I saw Mike Lindier twice last week working on uh, working on the organ, and it's a tremendous swell of enthusiasm. I hear you in the organ and in your singing when that happens. Ranks of pipes. What do we call uh, a group of handbell players? A choir? A handbell choir? Um, we, we talk about our uh, larger crowds that we have this time of year as our participating some of our winter partners. We see a lot of crowds still in Casa Grande today. Now, next week I'm not so sure. <laughs> there were many crowds in Jerusalem on that day. They were there because of the festival of Passover. It was a time where the Jewish people remembered very intensely their past and their salvation from slavery in Egypt. Can you hear those crowds? I can still hear them shouting. When the religious leaders heard that, they told them to shut up, be quiet, but nothing they could say would get the crowds to stop shouting. In fact, Jesus told them that if somehow they could stop them from shouting, the very rocks would start to sing. So came Jesus the Christ into the holy city of Jerusalem, riding as in ancient times the kings of Israel rode in times of peace and prosperity upon a donkey, the foal of a donkey. I can still hear those crowds. And what did they really have to celebrate anyway? Uh, though they've been, uh, they, they've been persecuted by many rulers and despots and been in slavery in Egypt, had won their freedom, but then had been conquered again and again by the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. But this one, this Jesus of Nazareth, this rabbi from Galilee, is he the one to come and save them? What really did they have to celebrate? Well, this Sunday in Lent, this last Sunday in Lent, this Palm Sunday, we will begin what was the most important week in human history after a tragic Friday. So bad, they call it good. After a tragic Friday, the story of God's redemptive plan for the salvation of us all will unfold. So don't just skip ahead to Easter. Don't miss Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Even take a moment on Holy Saturday to reflect on what's going to happen. Experience all that Christ did and experienced during that most important week. Because beyond the bad times, Beyond the betrayals, the, tri the trials and denials, comes the Sunday we call Easter. And that is something <laughs> worth shouting about. I shall read to you from the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 11th chapter. This is the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing here asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. 
when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, and say this with me, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And say this also, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in our eyes. Well, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. We come to worship, not for ourselves. We come to worship to stand alongside the works of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for making us part of your narrative. Now, give us Jesus. Give us Jesus, Lord. They can have all of the rest. Just give us Jesus. Amen. And so, Jesus said to two of his followers, hey, just go into the village ahead of you. You'll see a donkey there. Release it and bring it here. And if anybody asks you what you're doing, say, the Lord needs it. We'll send it right back. You know, there's no mention in the Bible of when that donkey returned to the owner. We just take Mark's word for it that Jesus is going to send it. Fred Craddock, one of my favorite authors lately, says that all, and they did, and so it was, and so they came with the donkey. They put their coats on it, and, and Jesus sat on it, and somebody remembered a prophecy buried 500 years into the ancient books of Israel, written by Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On a donkey because he came in peace. It's significant because if he had been an Israeli king in the time of war, he would have ridden a stallion. Instead, he comes in peace. Riding a donkey. That is the beginning of probably the most extraordinary week of Jesus' life. It was the spring of the year about this time, the time for the Jewish Passover, the central festival of the Jewish faith, a festival fueled by memory, one burning, searing memory, the liberation from slavery in Egypt. They remembered it in everything they did that week. And whenever they ate, whenever they sang, whatever they said, in every get-together, they remembered it. And now, it was very, very important to remember, because they were almost enslaved again, under the chariot wheels of the Romans, Tiberius Caesar. All the cruelties of empire crushing down upon them. And they're hoping again. And, and sometimes hope turns to revolt. And revolt into bloodshed. And you can only take it so long. And then freedom breaks out. Rome knew that, of course. And so at every year during Passover, they triple the military presence in Jerusalem. The military governor himself, Pontius Pilate, came down himself to, to see if some radical decisions had to be made about this possible revolt during the time of Passover. 
he, at all costs, was going to preserve the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, which was preserved, as you know, by the only way they knew, which was killed. They were ready. They were ready for the pilgrims. Well, they were nervous, I'm sure. So I said, I've been studying the, the sermons and the writings of Fred Craddock recently, and, and he said that he was in Dallas in 1963 at a banquet to honor a large professional society there. The mayor and some of his top officials were there to host the banquet, and Fred sat across from the chief of police. Is everything quiet in Dallas, he asked. He said, I hope so. I hope it stays that way, but I'm nervous. Fred said, really? Well, why are you nervous? The chief said, well, President and Mrs. Kennedy are coming next week, and I think I'm ready. We brought in extra troops. We brought in extra police. But you never know. There are a lot of crazies out there. Conscious pilot was ready, but he was nervous. All four Gospels tell this remarkable story of the pilgrims coming to the city at Passover, bringing their palms. It was a beautiful day, much like today, a beautiful time, but electric with all kind of expectations. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story of the singing and dancing and pulling branches on the road and hailing Jesus. But one, the one that is most unusual and read, I read just for you a moment ago, is the account of Mark. I don't know why, said Craddock, I don't know why it is different from all the others, but it is. For instance, if you compare it with the Gospel of Matthew, it seems so subdued, so muffled, too restrained. There are not enough balloons in the air, for instance. Have you ever seen a, a helium balloon just go floating <clears throat> off from a parade in the distance? On July the 4th, I believe it was 1998, it was three years before 9-11, and they still let people up into the Sears Tower in Chicago, up to the observation deck. Veterans Field was crowded with a million people and there was a constant stream of these helium balloons that got lost and, and, and let go, not on purpose, most of them. And I remember that the observation deck of the Sears Tower is so high that we saw these helium balloons float by below us. There were not enough balloons at this parade, Mark said. Something is not right. Matthew says, behold your king. Mark doesn't call him a king. Behold the son of David, says Matthew. Mark does not call him the son of David. Matthew said the streets were filled with children. Mark has no children in the story. Matthew says the whole city was astir. Not Mark. Matthew says that Jesus talked to the crowds and even his critics when he got to Jerusalem. Not and Mark, from the time he sits on the donkey until the next day, nothing but silence from Jesus. Matthew said, he went straight into the city and through the city to the temple. Mark says, the parade stopped at the city gates and Jesus went alone into the city and the temple. Matthew says, he cleansed the temple. Mark says, he went in and looked around, and nobody was there, so he went to Bethany. There's something sort of eerie about this. I remember uh, in Houston, Texas, in uh, right before Hurricane Katrina, uh, they, the city emptied out no, Hurricane Rita. Katrina was the New Orleans one, right? Yeah. Before Rita, uh, because we had seen what had happened in Katrina, the, the city closed down. The highways were clogged with cars trying to get, even McDonald's was closed. <laughs> That's serious, you know. When McDonald's boards up its windows, something is going to happen. Mark almost <clears throat> sounds like that. Something eerie is going on, something too 
restrained and subdued to be a festival and a parade and a Hosanna occasion. Now, I know what you're doing. You're thinking, well, now he's going to tell us why. I don't know why. Mark may have had one of those personalities that just didn't think it was appropriate to celebrate publicly. You know, people like that, right? You invite them to the party and they come all dressed in gray. <laughs> they can't turn it loose. There's no sense of spontaneity. I mean, they're good people. They make good committee members. But they don't have playfulness. They don't turn it loose. There's no sense of spontaneity. You can ask one of them to play Santa Claus in the Christmas parade, but they just say, oh, not ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, like you'd expect. It could be that Mark thinks that all this celebrating is a little bit inappropriate. There are many folks who do. They're just not appropriate. You're going to have a party tomorrow night, but just down the block from you, is the funeral home, and you know that there will be a funeral that night, and the parking lot will be thick with cars, and there will be people trying to sign the guest register at this sad occasion, trying to calm the nerves, dry the tears of the grieving close to your house. Are you still going to have that party? Is that appropriate? Mary sang lullabies to her baby, her firstborn, Jesus. She sang to him, but you want to say, Mary, hush! Don't you hear Rachel crying? What do you hear? The Bible says in, in Matthew that after the innocent babies in Jerusalem, were, or in Bethlehem, were killed, you could hear Rachel, the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, thousand years before, weeping for her children, and she would not be consoled because they were gone. Maybe, Mark thought, just maybe that celebration, well, was just not appropriate. Craddock says, it could be that Mark thought that it was a little premature, a little too early, like, like planting your garden too early. It doesn't come out right if you do that. Or maybe when you assume something is going to happen and it doesn't happen. The moment she was in the door, she said to her husband, Pack your bags, I won the lottery! He said, Where are we going? And she said, What do you mean, we? <laughs> so maybe Mark thought it was a little premature to celebrate. We talked about the prodigal son a lot here in Lent. We he came home, the father ran down the road and grabbed him and kissed him, and they killed the calf, and they invited musicians and brought in the neighbors, and there was singing and dancing. The older brother was not quite so forgiving. He said to his father, how do you know he'll stay home? He might change shirts, have a good night's sleep, eat at the banquet, pack up a lunch of the leftovers, and hit the road. Don't you think that maybe 30 days probation would be a good idea? See, I think Mark thinks celebration is a little premature. I don't know, but I do know that there is something in me that sympathizes with Mark in this muffled and restrained presentation of this material because I confess to you sometimes Reading the Bible makes me feel awkward in two different ways. Like, I'm not sure I'm in tune with what's happening here. So there are two things that sometimes make me uncomfortable. The Bible invites me and you, the reader, into some places where I feel I just don't belong. For, for instance, when Jesus went to Jairus' house, whose 12-year-old daughter was sick, but now she's dead, laying in her bedroom just a corpse. Can you hear the shouting? Can you hear the mourners, some friends, some professional mourners they brought in? Can you hear their sounds coming from the bedroom? 
Jesus comes in and says to all of them, get out. Get everybody out of here. And everybody's put out except the mom and the dad and the little girl and Jesus and Peter, James, and John. And, well, you and me, the reader, you go inside and you hear Jesus say, Talita kumi, little girl, get up. You see her, you see him tenderly take her hand, and you hear him tell her parents, give her something to eat. Craddock said that he didn't know that he felt he had the right to be there. Do you? Some people just read that and say, now what is the lesson for me in that today? It seems too personal. Don't be premature. Wait. Wait. See, after the Last Supper, Jesus takes his disciples, now only 11, and he says, watch and pray with me. My soul is heavy. Let this cup you hear from a distance, if you are awake. You, let, you hear Jesus say, please, God, everything is possible with you. Let this cup pass from me. And you see him sweat drops of blood, hour after hour, I'm not sure I, you know, I have earned the right to be in Gethsemane with Jesus. And at the cross, soldiers are mocking, disciples have abandoned him, and there is a disciple he loved, standing there with Mary, his mother. And there I am, the reader, and I actually hear him say to his disciple that he loved, take my mother home. I'm not sure I feel I have a right to be there. The Bible makes me nervous sometimes, letting me in on things I'm not ready for, have no, have no right to. And second, the Bible tells me things I don't want to know. Jesus prayed all night, and at the end of the praying came one of his disciples named Judas Iscariot. You know what the writer calls him? The one who betrayed Jesus. After that, every time his name comes up, he's the one who betrayed him. I'm not sure. I always want to be reminded about that. This, I know the Bible is looking back upon it, but the first time it meets G Judas, he says, he betrayed Jesus. That just, that messes it all up for me. You know, Judas was one of the twelve. He was a disciple. He cast out demons. He healed the sick. He preached the gospel. He was with Jesus in the passing out of the bread to the 5,000. He was in the boat when the Bible says they all bowed down and worshipped Jesus. He was with Thomas when Thomas said, well, let's go die with Jesus. Judas said, hey, brother, I'm with you. I wish I could have met Judas without the writer saying he was going to betray Jesus. That ruins it a little bit for me. That just ruins it. Like this story. By this time, Mark has told me three times, bless his heart, he's told me three times, this parade is going to the cross. It's not going to end up in Perry Park with a big rally and a band and trumpets and bunny hats. The parade is not going to end up with Jesus lifted on the shoulders of everybody saying, Behold your king! He is going to be lifted up on a cross! Mark has told me three times, and I tell you, it affects people. Because... I know where the parade is going. I want to go down into the street in Jerusalem and say to the crowd, hold it! Don't you know where you are going? It's not a parade, it's a funeral procession. You ought to know. You should know. You've been told three times. You remember when he was still in Galilee with his friends and his family, 
And his friends, they tried to kill him there. They tried to kill him in Nazareth. They tried to kill him in Capernaum. Now, if in Galilee with his friends and family, they tried to kill him, what do you think is going to happen here in Jerusalem, the center of all plots? The center of every plot going in, going on in the minds of people around every sticky cafe table in town. What do you think is going to happen? I want to say to them, stop the parade. Don't you have any idea what's happening? Well, I suppose it could be. It could be they just don't know. It's called blissful ignorance. Something I find myself living in all the time. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I just didn't. said he, he saw two little girls playing with a balloon one time, a red balloon, that had been inflated with helium, and it was floating up, and it would go to the ceiling, and then they try to get the string and pull it back down, and the littlest girl had to get on a chair and, and grab the string and pull it down, and they would pull it down, and they would take turns letting it go, letting it loose again. They were having a wonderful time. What struck him, though, was this was taking place in the lobby of a hospital. And there were over 200 rooms filled with pain and misery and grief and sickness and these two little girls in the lobby just innocently playing with the balloon. Do you think you should say to the little girls, what is the matter with you girls? Of course not. But this they in denial? You know, they just won't accept it? The only thing I can figure as a reason for doing what they're doing, shouting and dancing and singing on the way to the crucifixion, is I just don't think I know what kind of extraordinary faith they must have had. I know it was true of some of the women. They were in the parade, Mary, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, others. They were there when he was crucified. They were there when he was buried. And on Sunday morning, they were there early to prepare the body because he was buried in such a hurry. Credit says, I, I stopped them on the way out there to the cemetery, and I said, how can you keep doing this? He's dead. And one of them, I don't remember which one, said, we're persuaded that we can keep doing this because we're persuaded that neither life nor death nor things present nor things to come, not height, Death, angel, demon, anything else in all creation, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love we find in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can still hear them. Pray with me. Jesus, on this day you were welcomed in a triumphant processional to Jerusalem. Give us the grace, the faith, good Lord, to join the celebration because we know where it ends. Not in a grave, but in paradise. So we, Deo Gloria, to God alone, Thank mm -hmm. you.
not feel you must rush into Easter. There's Monday, Thursday, you have to come. Good Friday. Take a moment of reflection on Holy Saturday to reflect on what's going to happen. Your faith will be stronger and better rewarded as you do so because you have taken the time to experience what Jesus experienced in the most extraordinary day and week of his life. When you do so, know that you are blessed by God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.